Um, and thank you very much, everyone, for agreeing to participate in all of this. Um, welcome to um, Gabby and welcome to Louis and welcome to you all as this first introduction to the future of strategy 2021. Um, what a year it's been. Um, so last year we were in the middle of the pandemic, um, but during during the past year, trade has really become part of our public discourse. It's become something that we have started, um, started to worry about, started to think about. We've had disruptions to supply chains. We can all remember the shortage of um, toilet rolls. Um, we've had pandemic induced shortages, but also logistical shortages, which have disrupted trade into this year. Economic nationalism around vaccines and medical supplies, Brexit and a new administration in the United States. And then, of course, we can't ignore it. Uh, we've had scandal and fraud allegations around Greensill and supply chain finance. Against that backdrop, um, world trade volumes fell by around 5.3% last year, um, and the value was around 11.2%, but it feels as though trade has changed forever. And that's the purpose of this event. A week of events, um, a week of thought leadership, a week of planning, a week of discussion um, to talk about sustainable trade, how we move forward, how we deal with technological changes that are obvious um, and in front of us right now, and of course, shifting spheres of influence. But it's no accident that we've organised this event at the um, towards the end of um, COP26. The biggest challenge facing trade as we move into 2020, the end of 2021 and into 2022, is going to be sustainable trade. The world of trade has to change. Trade is becoming something that um, is seen as one of the bad boys in the room because there is so much pollution that is out there as a result of emissions from trade. Yet everybody I speak to in the, in the sector wants to make a difference. Everybody in the banking sector, businesses, they want their supply chains to become sustainable. It's just a human thing, who wouldn't? So with me to discuss all of this, and more are Louis Taylor, who is the CEO of UK Export Finance, and Gabby Buck, who is the Managing Director of GKB Ventures, which is a boutique export credit agency and export credit finance consultancy. Gabby, Louis, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and, and, and Gabby, maybe I'll start with you. Um, we talked a lot last year about, about um, geopolitics. And we talked a lot about what the consequences were going to be um, for the world if everything stayed as they are, um, as, as they were last year. We now have a new administration in Washington. Have the geopolitics shifted? Can we say that we have a more multilateral feeling to the trade environment? And is that making life easier? Uh, OK, thank you, Rebecca. And it's great to be with Louis. Um, I think it's got worse. Um, so the geo, you're asking two questions here. The geopolitical, geoeconomic situation, I think it's worse. Our relationship with Europe is not good. Our standing globally, I think, is somewhat undermined, given that we kind of there's a question mark about the UK respecting the rule of law. The relationship with China is, you know, we are a rule taker. You just got to look at what's happening in Hong Kong. Um, and I think, and oh, I fear that the UK is being bypassed. You only need to look at certain trade data, for example, the trade between, um, or cargo between, and the ferries between Republic of Ireland and France has gone up fourfold. You've got to look at the offshoring of UK banking assets into, you, into Europe. And we're losing, you know, our manufacturing, well, a lot of our manufacturing has, has lifted and, and moved. And I'm thinking in particular, Honda, who were uh, 35 years in Swindon, um, and you know, earlier this year, a loss of 3,000 jobs. Um, so I think we've got to be acknowledging that it's been a challenging year because of COVID, because of Brexit, and I think that um, uh, we need to change and adapt um, because Europe is our biggest trading partner. They're on our doorstep. Um, in terms of um, the US, I think that the situation there is 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 somewhat more um, 
challenging in that whilst with Joe Biden, um, we don't have that rhetoric of America first. Um, there still is, I think, a soft um, situation where the US are going to invest into American workers and make them more competitive. Um, in the last time we spoke, Lou and I, we were talking about US Exim's 27 billion program on China and transformational exports, which I flagged can also be used against the UK. Um, but the biggest issue I see with the US is that Biden is, in, in my opinion, in no rush to sign a trade agreement with the UK. I think he will defend the Good Friday Agreement to the hilt. You know, he, he kind of sees himself as an Irish American. Um, but most importantly, Biden's stance on defending the Good Friday Agreement is a cornerstone of US foreign policy. And it's one of the very few things that he can defend where he will have the full support of the Republican Party. So on that side, I don't think he's going to budge. So all in all, slightly more challenging than we were last year. Great stuff. It's Monday morning um, <laughs> and we're at the start of the week and we're starting off on a really blindingly positive note. Louis, what's your view of all of that? <laughs> Well, uh, not to get too philosophical about it, I mean, uh, I think things are never as good or as bad as they seem. How about that as a starting point? Um, look, I mean, there are some uh, difficult headwinds, for sure. Uh, I think that um, the Trump administration changed the agenda for good on China, and that is not uh, in a way that necessarily encourages uh, really sort of positive collaboration, particularly in trade matters. And so there are some serious issues that still need resolving around that whole relationship. Although, you know, as you and I have discussed before, uh, it is possible to demonize China uh, to an extent that is not necessarily reflective of reality. Um, but uh, China is clearly a major issue. For the UK, I mean, multilateralism remains something they're totally committed to. Uh, everybody's going to throw Brexit at me about what the, you know, we've left the EU and how multilateral is that. But I mean, WTO in terms of trade uh, is the organization that um, still the UK is massively committed to, uh, committed to the G7 uh, as well, uh, and committed to uh, opening up markets uh, around the world. Now, in terms of what Gabby was saying about the US, I mean, it's pretty clear that the Biden administration doesn't have new trade agreements particularly high on its agenda, probably because, for the most part, uh, their trade with partners uh, and with uh, friendly partners particularly uh, is actually, it's not so bad. It's not a, a major burning issue for them. I think we probably have greater anxiety here in the UK around this just because of um, the need to reestablish ourselves on the the sort of global stage in terms of trade policy. Um, but actually trade with the US is, I mean, it's huge. It's not that it couldn't be made better, but the sense perhaps is over in Washington, less of a burning need to do a trade agreement with us or even trade agreements with others, whether they join the CPTPP or whatever. However, it is also fair to say that the Biden administration has sought to address some specific trade issues around Airbus Boeing, for example. And then last week we saw the agreement with the EU which it would be hoped would be uh, replicated with the UK in relation to steel and aluminium exports as well. So I think that they're a little bit more tactical at the moment in their focus. They do want to be a bit more um, multilateral, but to say that they are wholeheartedly embracing a change of, uh, of free trade agreements would be, uh, I think, not necessarily right. I think actually what is also making trade, the outlook for trade quite tricky is the, out, is the fallout from the pandemic. And that I think has totally shifted the balance between uh, and the equation of efficiency versus resilience. And if you've got a 100% efficient supply chain that's just in time, its resilience is incredibly low. And people have re realized that they want a bit more resilience in their, in their supply chains. And that simply is going to mean you're gonna create more redundancy and more cost and lower returns in supply chains. And I think that that is a trickier thing for us to all uh, kind of adapt to as we go forward, um, perhaps in some of the, the difficulties in trade agreements. 
I, I think that's a point very well made, and I'd, I'd like to keep you on that, and then I'll bring Gabby in if I may. Um, so, so we're looking at challenges in supply chains, um, and there are two big pressures as far as I can see it. I mean, as, you know, just in terms of the work we do, it looks like there is um, an element of just in case beginning to build into supply chains. A lot more, um, a lot more regionalism, um, intra-regional trade going on, um, and this is creating a situation where we've moved from that just in time delivery type system through to something that is far more um well actually we'll build up stocks we'll do things on a just-in-case basis and we'll trade with people so that we reduce reliance on a single supplier but the other thing that's happening of course and this will be a major theme through this conference is the fact that we have um supply chain tracking which is coming down the line so one thing the us has done is raise um awareness of the fact that we need to think about sustainability in the round we need to think about how um, sustainable all of our supply chains are at tier three four five that's going to present enormous problems to smes isn't it so i think that um it is going to be challenging i don't particularly think for smes um but i think for, for supply chains generally whether you're a big supply chain integrator like a, a rolls royce or a Bo airbus or a boeing in aerospace uh, or whether you know it's um, it's a fashion uh, chain that you're running. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily the big issue. I mean, I think in terms of sustainability, I, I talked about redundancy uh, and resilience in supply chains generally, just to, to keep things moving. But actually, if you look at the way the world's going in terms of sustainability and in renewable energy, the need for backup to um, you know solar and wind in the UK, for example, uh, because for the days that are, are, are cloudy and uh, and calm. Uh, we're going to have to have um, greater resilience and greater redundancy and greater cost and lower returns, perhaps in energy as well, for example. So I think that um, that's the challenge. It's, it's the project sponsor level down. I don't think SMEs are uniquely affected by this. I think everybody is pretty affected by this. Gary, do you agree with that? Yeah, I do agree with Louis there. I think that, um, you know, your, your, your question is, you know, supply chain shortage is it a big concern and and you know louis mentioned resilience is going to increase cost and i think that's going to be a factor it's um so if you can't afford to pay for the increased cost then this is a concern you know log particularly logistic costs for transportation has gone through the roof and you know and this will need to be passed on to the end customer <clears throat> pardon me i was speaking um, quite recently to logistics uk who are the trade body for the haulage company. And they were saying that here in the UK, their gross margin is 1.4%. So any change, any change in costs um, will need to be passed through. Um, and so I think, you know, this issue about resilience, about China, about transportation, about tracking, I, I think is, um, you know, an issue as Louis was saying, for all companies, whether you're at the top end or at the at the bottom end of the supply chain. You know, I would say, Rebecca, I'm not sort of massively pessimistic about all of this. I mean, I think it's going to be a bit of a fact of life and maybe it's reflected in some higher inflation for a while, uh, which is kind of being uh, headlined uh, across the media globally, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't resolve from the, uh, the idea that resilience is going to mean cost. So, so it, I, I think that's fairly um, understood, and I think there's been, I think there's been a lot of inflationary pressure over the last twenty months or so, partly because of the COVID pandemic, stuff being misplaced, and, and obviously that's created a temporary um, inflationary pressure. But I think as well, um, one of the consequences for UK exporters was always going to be redistributing and rethinking about supply chains um, was going to push up costs as well. But I think, I think I'd like to push you a little bit because. Um, because some of the pressures at the moment are asking for levels of sustainability reporting amongst SMEs and, um, and compliance or will do as they come down the line, which may actually affect um, supply chain finance for those companies at the bottom. And I think that's probably where we need to be focusing because within all of this there are huge opportunities and, and, and I think we understand that. But the role of sort of helping SMEs transition from being, you know, carbon intensive and so on 
but through to being more focused on um, focused on things that actually are acceptable in terms of the EU taxonomy, in terms of other taxonomies, sustainable development goals. Those actually need to be factored in now into supply chain finance, don't they? So, uh, look, I think that's right, but I think there's no massive revolution or some massive cutoff point that's suddenly going to cause a step change uh, in increasing costs. But, I mean, we ourselves are, are making climate-related financial disclosures. We've done qualitative ones so far, but the next step is quantitative ones. And the calculation of the emissions around our portfolio, for example, and that you were a financial institution, is really pretty tricky. But I think that the way most things in the sustainability world are going to work are it's a bit like that animal in uh, dr doolittle the push me pull you there's a there are, there are inherent tensions in all of this there's an element of carrot and an element of stick uh and um you know if they're if sme's customers aren't going to accept a dirty supply chain then the sme is going to have to adapt to survive uh similarly if the prime's customers aren't going to and, and investors aren't going to accept a dirty supply chain they're going to have to adapt and survive so you know, government driving companies to make disclosures is going to highlight for investors and customers the impact of the company. And then that's a, there's an element of carrot and stick about that. So like I say, I mean, I don't think there's a, a massive cliff edge here, uh, but no question about it, the way we run our businesses will adapt. But, uh, you know, hopefully um, if COP uh, does its stuff next week, uh, everybody's focused on the same things and you don't end up with some countries having particular competitive disadvantage. And I think that Louis and UK Export Finance are leading the way. I was, <clears throat> Louis, I was very encouraged to listen to your panel um, at the Finance Day programme at the British Pavilion in Glasgow. And for those on, who's listening to this, it's got to be on to YouTube somewhere. And I think they should listen to this. You know, you're right. We need to decarbonise, build back better and faster. And the ECAs will be key. And the decision that you were reinforcing at COP26 that the UK government will no longer support carbon projects, which meant no aid, no trade, no ECA support for oil and gas, as well as coal, I think is, is very welcome. And congratulations to you for being that bold, because that sort of announcement is needed. And, and I hope that it will lead other ECAs to follow. Um, and a decision like this will change behavior, not just with the ECAs, but also I think I feel with the banks and and with contractors. Gabby, it's uh, it's really kind of you to congratulate me, but really it's ministers. This is government policy. So uh, congratulations to ministers. But I mean, I agree with you. I hope that others follow. The risk that we faced, I think, was that the ECAs would become a carbon sink because the private sector would move away from financing carbon projects. And actually the gap really that we want to fill because ECAs are there to fill gaps in private sector provision, the gaps we want to fill are uh, renewable projects in developing markets where the risk is such that it's unbankable for private sector. That's I think um, the gap. And like I said on the panel, we're totally focused on a cleaner, greener future rather than on trying to shimmy a fossil fuel project into environmental and sustainability concerns that actually it, it may not be possible to do anything. I think there's a very interesting point there, isn't there, about how expectations adapt. <clears throat> so, you know me, I come from an economics background. So, um, you know, there are two models, either expectations adapt gradually and you begin to accept that you're going to have to change things and it happens over a period of time. Or if you're taking a decision like the one you've just taken, um, everybody adapts immediately because it happens straight away. And that's actually, as, as Louis says, a very bold thing to do. The hope is that everybody carry, goes along with you because otherwise there will be some ECAs that aren't working in the same way. And one of the things that's come out of conversations we've had while we've been preparing for, for this week um, has been the fact that um, everybody is saying everybody has to act simultaneously. This is pure multilateralism. Otherwise people will be left behind. Is that a danger? Um, I'm not sure it's a danger. I mean, I, I think the important thing on this is, well, let me take one step back, actually. The Chinese word for crisis is danger opportunity, right? Um, uh, the characters uh, in, in uh, Chinese script. Uh, and I think that's right. There is an opportunity in here. And actually, um, you know, you, the push me pull you again is, is there in, in all of these things. Uh, so um, it's, uh, I don't think it's, it's all one way. It will be iterative. Uh, you know, we can force Shell to sell all its coal assets, but if they sell them to a 
you know, a pure financial investor whose interest is to run them as long as possible, maybe we extend the life of those coal assets versus, you know, having them in a, a, a PLC, which is going to wind them down and have investor pressure and all, all the rest of it. So I think we've got to be a bit careful about how we do this um, and recognize the inherent tensions in this, but we do need everybody to be working together on it. So, Gary, what does everyone do? Well, I, I think government is creating a path. I think the speed of transition by governments will, I suspect, cause banks and some exporters to spend the next 12 months complaining. And, you know, because it, the, the speed that the government have made these announcement, announcements is, I think, ahead of the curve of, of the industry and, and the banking market. Um, but we have to move forward. You know, one has to bear in mind, if you look at the total ECA volumes, um, those sectors that have taken the biggest advantage of ECA support is, or has been historically, oil and gas, defence, aviation, cruise ships, um, and some of these will need to adapt, and the banks will need to adapt. I don't think, um, and I'm a banker by heart, and I used to work most of my career in banking. I personally don't believe, Rebecca, the statement you make um, about accepting that change has fully been accepted by the banking market. And the comment Louis just made about carbon sink or making sure that the ECAs are not the carbon sink, um, I think it's a very important um, point to make. You know, a lot of the time, the banks will hide behind the export credit agencies and, I, and that's why I think that the announcement made to stop doing these sectors that um, that the UK government and UK export finance are doing as part of the policy um, is is important and exciting. I think there's going to be a you know big change for the export credit agencies going forward. And I think Rebecca as well. Gabby makes a good point about the other sectors that. Uh, you know, export credit agencies are heavily involved in. I mean, aviation, for example, is probably going to be the last sector to go net, truly net zero. Uh, you know, the calorific content of kerosene is difficult to replicate, get a thing off the ground to defy gravity. But, you know, we're committed to best available technology. Nobody's saying that a net zero world involves no flying or no plastics or whatever else. It's just how we, how we produce all of that. And already we're building sustainability linked loan principles into some of our lending into aviation. I'm pretty sure that we will be very soon bringing in a requirement for airlines who receive ECA support uh, to use a percentage of sustainable aviation fuel uh, and that those percentages will, will increase. So I think we can still be a force of good whilst at the same time driving the change that is possible because you know, what is possible and what is needed, the gap in between is technology and that we're going to be committed to, to supporting that as well. So I think um, really the, the question about the opportunities, and you've said this push me, pull you um, type thing, but there are huge opportunities out there. Where are the big opportunities, Louis? Where are we going to see um, the big changes happening over the next year? And what do we need to do to adapt to those? So, Rebecca, I mean, I think it's a little like, uh, and I'm showing my age, uh, what people said about telecoms when the Berlin Wall came down, that actually the, the fixed line network in Eastern Europe was awful. And why don't they just go straight to mobile? It didn't quite happen that way. But I think that there are very, a lot of industries, and energy not least, um, in a lot of developing markets where there's no need to go through uh, oil and gas because the, you know, the, the cost of renewable energy, particularly solar, uh, has come down so far and is actually lower than uh, pretty much all fossil fuel from the get-go. So I think there's a huge opportunity there. I think the other element to all of this is that um, you generate renewable energy where the environment is right, not necessarily where the energy is consumed. So I think there's a huge opportunity in grid. Uh, you know, just to take a, a different example, I mean, it's perfectly possible to see Saudi Arabia as a massive exporter of energy in 30 years' time, not through gas and oil pipelines and tankers, but through high voltage DC lines off solar panels sitting in the desert right up into Europe. And instead of gas pipelines from Russia, maybe it's, um, it's, it's electricity lines from the Middle East. So, you know, there's huge opportunities around all of that. And, you know, we've still got to figure out how to green the steel industry, for example. Uh, I mean, you know, who's, who's going to green the Indian steel industry or the Chinese steel industry or our own steel industry, frankly? You know, British Steel has two blast furnaces up in, uh, up in Scunthorpe. So the opportunity, I mean, where isn't there opportunity? 
So, so Gabby, are banks going to become venture capitalists, capturing all the opportunity and helping small businesses grow into the new technology spaces? Or is this something that isn't just about, about innovation funding, it's actually about um, funding trade in a different way? I think the banks are struggling. I think the banks uh, are struggling to, to, um, to find their niche. I think the market is very fragmented now. You know, in the days I was in export finance, you know, in my heyday, we used to do anything anywhere. Um, and it was a great industry to be in because you just had complete um, variety geographically and, and sector wise. And, and that's not now the case for banks and banks are very focused on particular sectors, particular geography or particular clients. So I think the change and the excitement that Louis um, was alluding to, I think, is um, is going to put some pressure on banks to to adapt and change. And I and I personally believe that this next twelve months, um, that's what the banks will will need to do. And I think they will come out of this because trade is and you know it's the lifeblood of industry and the lifeblood of supporting your corporate. So um, they just need to go through that transition. Um, that's as much as I can say at this moment in time on this. So, Rebecca, let me just firstly add that I, firstly, Gabby, I hope that your heyday is still to come, you know, I mean, <laughs> uh, but um, I think that uh, we need to focus on the, on the new risks that all of this is going to involve. There's not a single net zero by 2050 commitment that can be met without new technology that doesn't yet exist. That, to me, Rebecca, implies that um, whilst uh, you know, what we would call bleeding edge technology, you know, conceptual technology is pure equity risk. Uh, we, particularly the ECAs, but I hope banks too, would feel they need to be at the leading edge of a lot of this technology, taking more technology risk, pricing it, fair dues. Um, we need to take a bit more technology risk. So that will enable, um, you know, projects that are currently unbankable in developing markets uh, you know, to, to be more bankable. So if, if a UK export finance gives a completion guarantee on new technology or a technology new to market, uh, to that particular market, then that will take out a, an element of risk that may be inhibiting private sector investment. Similarly, you know, we might um, look at focusing our support on a first loss piece, the presence of which makes it easier for private sector investors to come into those projects. Or we could guarantee a power purchase agreement. So being much more focused in the support that we give to take out a risk element that inhibits private sector investment, I think is where we are probably going to be going in the next few years. And we're certainly looking at that with our treasury colleagues in, in the government. So, so um, there's, a, there's a question that's coming through from the audience, which I'll, I'll just inject here. Which of the banks that are going to lead uh, the way um, in cross-border trade finance? And who are you working with to, to make sure that happens? Or does everybody have to work have to work in this space? Because I mean, from the point of view of from the point of view of outside, there are huge innovation opportunities. You've talked a lot about, um, about emerging markets as well. And I think the emerging market space is incredibly important. Are there, is, it, is this something everybody has to do now? Everybody has to get onto that page of sort of supporting emerging markets, allowing that transition to happen and funding for innovation and lead so that in a sense, uh, everybody is leading the way, not just one bank. So Rebecca, not to sound too uh, evangelical about it. I mean, I think it is down to uh, everybody uh, to work um, pretty collaboratively around spreading technologies particularly. So in relation to net zero by 2050, I mean, my view is there is not a single developed market in the world. We are all developing markets. And the mentality we need around that is that we need to be able to employ new technology, roll it out. And frankly, if we roll, you know, develop the technology and roll it out in the UK and nobody else does, there's no point. We're 1% of emissions and we could go net zero and nobody else does and it's all for naught. So you know, there's a, the trade in all of this technology is incredibly important actually, uh, and the proliferation of the technology and the squeezing down of cost by scale, uh, all of those things. And the, I think the challenge of it is not the concept, the challenge is the pace at which it's got to happen. Really. Uh, and that means that private sector money is going to be way more important. And I think what we should also be focusing on is causing the formation of large pools of domestic long-term capital in, in developing markets through 
the life insurance industry through a pension industry, because so much of the infrastructure that's needed in developing markets will generate local currency revenues and financing it all in long dollars doesn't make a lot of sense, actually. So I think that, you know, at UCAF, we've had for some time the ability to offer guarantees in many local currencies, and we're really going to be pushing that more in a lot of these uh, sort of domestic energy projects, particularly, where the revenues are going to be local currency as well. So that local currency point is a really interesting one because we've just done some work um, in um, in Africa for the African uh, continent free trade area. And one of the pieces of, of, of feedback that's come back is we are finding it really difficult and we want to be able to trade in local currency. So, um, you know, we're going to be able to make these transitions a lot more quickly if we can trade in local local currency that builds things up. So, so you're saying that's something that's happening. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think to, to an extent, I mean, you know, it's, it's early days, really. Um, but I, I think local banks um, will play a big part in this or should play a big part in this as well. And truthfully, I mean, I know the questioner talks about HSBC and Standard Chartered, um, but, you know, you could add most of the international banks that have big networks where they probably quite long local currency and relatively short opportunities profitably to use that. In collaboration with, for example, the export credit agencies on local projects, um, actually could be could be really really um, positive. I think. But Gary, some of that is to do with the availability of correspondent banks, isn't it, in emerging markets as well? Does that create issues? Well, I think Louis Taylor and, and UKF is a good example where they have I could be wrong, sixty two or sixty three different currencies, sixty one local currencies. Or more, even more, really. more, more. <laughs> <Okay. Right. laughs> so, but you know, let's say in excess of sixty local currencies, which UKF have already approved, that they could undertake. And the point that Louis makes, I fully, fully endorse that. Where you, we, or the industry is doing social infrastructure, where the revenues of the project are going to be in local currency, it's madness to have that funded in in hard currency because the debt becomes unsustainable. Uh, for for the sovereign or for the um, underlying borrower, the challenge I think though is that um, the the knowledge about export credit is often with international banks, and the funding of local currency is with local banks or regional banks. <clears throat> and you know the trend I'm seeing is that the two are merging, um, or the power of the regional banks and the influence of the regional banks in terms of doing this type of export credit financing um, will, will, will rise. I think it's, it is difficult um, for a established export credit agency bank who have got long position in dollars or long positions in euros to be offering their clients local currency financing when it's not a domestic currency for that bank. So um, I think there's gonna be change in adaption <clears throat> You know, I was quite encouraged the other day, the OECD have changed the rules um, where they're allowing for the first time ever the South African RAND to be eligible for being the a, a fixed rate OECD SIR rate. Um, long overdue, in my opinion, um, but that's a change uh, and a positive change for infrastructure projects in South Africa. Uh, and also, you know, the export credit agencies are fully aware of the um, debt burden a lot of countries have got and their challenges of raising the 15%. And I was also encouraged to hear that the export credit agencies for low middle income countries and sovereign backed projects will raise the level of cover from 85 to 95%. Um, I would have liked it to gone to 100%, but you know, we'll take the we'll take the 95. So I think there's there's a lot of change going on. I think the next 12 months are going to be, in my opinion, for all of the reasons that we've outlined some of the most interesting 12 months that we've ever seen in the ECA market. So uh, this, this is a really, a really good um, conclusion to be coming to because we started off feeling, well, actually things are worse right now than they were. But given that it's Monday morning, we would like to feel that we're going into the rest of the week in a relatively cheerful way. So given, given that you're saying there are huge opportunities over the next 12 months, what are we going to be talking about in 12 months time as that we've achieved and can we do this without china well look i think it's um we're right in the foothills so i think what we'll be talking about 
uh, in a year's time is uh, some of the early successes, but um, really how we continue to accelerate and grow the pace of, um, of what, what, is, what is being achieved. I think um, that we absolutely have to collaborate more and more with everybody. Uh, and it sounds like very idealistic, but if we just think about China, I mean, there's a lot of noise in a quite a negative way, some of it fair, some of it less fair about Belt and Road. Uh, and actually, I'm, you know, I can look forward 10 to 15 years and China will have every bit of good technology in the clean green space that we will and actually will be looking to internationalize that in a very, very powerful way. Uh, just as they have been with some infrastructure. And, uh, you know, who are we to say that's necessarily actually a bad thing if we accelerate the rollout of clean green technology, helping to get towards net zero by 2050 across the developing world and beyond, you know, isn't that a great thing? So actually, I think there is the opportunity for collaboration. I think it's really important with China to keep the commerce commercial and keep the politics separate from the commerce to the extent you can. Not always possible. Um, but I think to the extent we can, that's certainly what we'll be looking to do and find ways to collaborate with Chinese contractors, Chinese um, um, you know, uh, providers of, of equipment uh, alongside UK suppliers as well. Gary, do you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I mean, UK have got a cooperation agreement already with Sun Shaw, and I, and I see that increasing. Um, I think the role, you know, to ask, answer the question about what will we be discussing in 12 months time? I think the role of the export credit agencies will increase. So, um, and I think they will be filling that gap. And I think the banks will still be there, but there will be very, in my opinion, it will be a much more fragmented market. So I, I think, you know, banks will really start to drill down as to where they are, um, their focus from a geographic or from a sector basis. And they will be, you know, maximizing that opportunity as much as they can and there will be other parts of the market that they'll just completely ignore so there's enough business there's enough banks but from a banking side it's going to be fragmented but the export credit agencies i think are going to be the glue that brings all of that cooperation together just one last question then um with all of this you've both said you know things are moving very quickly um, and sustainability in a green sense is one of the things that we we need to be um, we need to be excited about because actually there are some huge opportunities about um, at the moment and I, I I can see all of that. Does anybody get left behind? Um, so do, do just a, just a final point. Does anybody get left behind? Do the small businesses in global supply chains do emerging regions in emerging economies get get left behind? Or is this something that actually using technology we can we can um we can create so that everybody starts to get involved and we really create that big uplift in trade rather than sort of the the temporary uplift that we had after the last global financial crisis look at I, I don't think anybody needs to get left behind uh but um i think in a way you could see that this is an opportunity for capitalism really to restate it the case its case you know it's about the race to find these technologies and then the race to roll them out. I mean, this is the essence of capitalism in, in a way. And there will, this will involve renewal and it will involve some people and some businesses um, being less advantaged unless they adapt. So adaptation and, and adaptability is the key thing. But, um, uh, you know, I think a lot of the opportunity, uh, Rebecca, is really around uh, replacement as much as it is about uh, incremental trade. I mean, you know, even if you're running coal-fired power stations now, at some point, you've got to replace them. Uh, so a lot of renewable energy is going to replace fossil fuel technology. It's not necessarily incremental to it. So there is a massive opportunity out there for those who are going to be doing the renovation work and all the rest of it. But uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily going to massively um, increase GDP growth globally. I agree. I agree. I think... Um adapt and change. Those that do adapt and change will see this as a real opportunity. I think those that could, could get left behind, I think are actually the, the banks. I think the, the banks I'm seeing have been quite slow at the moment to, to realize what's going on. You know, I, I, you know, you read a lot. I was, you know, reading the ICC paper on sustainability and, but you ask the banks, what is it that you will actually do to help sponsors or suppliers and export in this field. And, and they come up quite short in terms of saying, we will, we will actually do this 
to encourage this change. Um, so I'm a bit fearful for the banks. I think they need to adapt much quicker. I think for the rest of the market, I think you know this is a real opportunity. Gabby, Louis, thank you so much. My takeaway from this is that we're not looking necessarily as we used to as uh, in a advanced of capitalist economies at creative destruction and more at creative evolution and how we create a planet that actually we're all pr proud to live on. Um, huge opportunities ahead. It's lovely to end on an upbeat note fascinating session for me and for everyone and just a note to everybody else do please join us for the next session at half past 10 um, when we're going to be talking about what is sustainable trade um louis gabby thank you very very much indeed that was fantastic thank you thank you very much thank you